Hello, we are here today with Scott Pasco, one of our um, Bainbridge Arts and Crafts roster artists um, who we're proud to be showing in our show that we're calling Scapes. Um, coming in February in the gallery. My name is Deborah Rosinski. I'm executive director here at Bainbridge Arts and Crafts. It's, it's really been a privilege, um, especially to do these interviews with artists and get to know you guys better through this, this medium. Um, so Scott, I'm, I'm really happy to have you here today um, talking with us. Um, Maybe you can go into your background a bit for us. I um, I see that you have a background as a landscape architect and ran your own business. And it seems like an obvious um, kind of set of roots for some of the subject matter that your work um, is focused on landscapes and and the environment. And um, I'll, I'll turn it over to you and, and if you could give us kind of an overview of how you got to this place as an artist, that'd be great. Well, uh, to start out with, I'm a, I'm a native of Western Washington. So I've lived my entire life on, uh, on the West Coast um, and coastal no Northwest particularly. And, and I'm in love with salt water, fresh water, rivers. Um, everything doing with water. Um, as you made mention of, um, I, I was a landscape architect, I had my own practice for over 20 years and segued from that into environmental conservation, uh, was a watershed coordinator for a small watershed in uh, South Whidbey Island and moved on from there to be the um, uh, regional land trust conservation director for Great Peninsula Conservancy. Um, for five years. And since then, picked up kind of where I left off with art, having discovered pastel uh, in my early 30s. I always thought that I would come back to that medium and have been painting for the last five to six years since I retired. No, it's mostly, well, I refer to these as paintings because I use the broad end of a soft pastel stick. Uh -huh. um, and uh, which is more using pastel in a painterly manner. That's a, a fairly controversial. Some people relate to pastel more as a drawing medium, uh, whereas I really think of it as painting and do addition, uh, layering, layer uh, different colors together, and then actually subtract and add texture with a variety of different tools. So. Um, in effect, you can see marks on my pastels, um, and sometimes I leave mistakes purposefully just so that you see the remnant of my handwork, um, and that lends it a more painterly kind of characteristic. I do not use any other medium other than just, you know, pastels. Ah, um, thank you for clarifying that. It, it, it seemed that that was the case. And um, I, I find it really interesting, the mix of tools that you're using to remove color and add color and, and um, create texture. And it creates very evocative images. And I know recently we had a piece of yours um, that a couple came in and looked at and it just brought them back to a trip they took to Utah and they loved it so much and it felt so much like the place they had been that they just had to bring it home with them. So it's, um, it's a powerful kind of evocative feel that you get across in your work. So I wasn't sure if you'd heard that story. So <laughs> I wanted to make you aware that um, that that happens. Well, I often draw upon memories of just um, rely almost sometimes on just abstract photographs that really don't have any kind of correlation with any sort of reality. And somehow, whether it's, you know, the uh, shapes, color, um, composition, something trips me 
I recall memories almost on an intuitive basis, and, and that sets a direction. Just recently, within the last couple of years, I've been focusing a lot on gesture and movement, and um, and uh, actually to add texture through subtraction. Uh, my favorite tool is probably a stiff two-inch paintbrush that uh, has been severely abused, but works quite nicely for me in terms of getting movement uh, and gesture into my uh, paintings. Now you've been a photographer as well. Do you continue to take photographs kind of to create um, reference material to draw from? Yes, and actually the reference material that I was relating to is I've spent three years at Boat Haven in Port Townsend. I live in Port Townsend and Boat Haven is where they put the, take the boats out and um, restore them. Um, and, and oftentimes that's a subtractive methodology where they're actually taking off layers off of the holes of boats and you get kind of a cross section of their history by just looking at the different colors and textures um, that are created when they start taking, stripping off the holes to repaint them. And often you'll see tool marks. I've done a whole series of abstract photographs and actually they are really my primary source material photographically for the abstract landscapes that I do. For some reason, they just seem to trip me into a certain direction. Uh, often that direction just evolves over the course of painting and, and until I find that uh, it becomes intuitive and I can just move uh, along the alignment of that direction. And uh, so I, I also photograph landscapes if I ever really beautiful photograph, top notch, I'll use that uh, compositionally and color wise, um, but uh, it has to be just perfect for me to actually uh, work with it. And, and with photography, you don't really work with the color so much as the composition. And it, uh, photography has always been a compositional tool for me primarily. And I've always photographed in color. And I think some of my um, natural proclivity toward certain uh, values and hues comes from just, you know, doing photography since I was 13 and mostly mm -hmm. landscape photography. I like things that are uh, kind of aging and in a state of decomposition. Mm -hmm. And um, what I really find interesting about the, the boats um, is the amount of texture that goes into sanding them too. So you get actually a sense of the tools behind the restoration. And uh, I hope that some of that inculcates itself into the painting because I, you really, when you paint um, and when you do art, uh, especially if some you have somebody who's purchasing it, you want it to age over time and and for the observer to find more complexity in it after looking at it over the course of the long period of time because that really adds to the um, sublimity of the art form and uh, its ability to um, conjure up different reactions from um, somebody over a long period of time. I always enjoyed spending a lot of time at a site trying to get the sense of place as to what distinguished it from other places and drawing upon that and working with a Northwest vernacular as well. And uh, Northwest vernacular inclusive of uh, um, especially uh, with attention to uh, Japanese aesthetics as well and um, uh, such as borrowed scenery, uh, such as uh, Migakure, I'm not so sure whether I'm pronouncing that correctly, but that's hidden and revealed, so you don't see the totality of a landscape at the same time, uh, that there are juxtapositions um, 
um, to create distance and, and create a sense of mystery and discovery, um, which as I alluded to before is part of, you know, hopefully sharing your art with other people as well is that they discover. Yeah, so I was always working uh, with what I find distinguishable within the Northwest as a distinctive place. Uh, and that's part of being part of the Pan Pacific culture, which does include Japan. I've traveled to Japan a couple of times and actually have, um, um, looks like in September of 2022, I may be in a uh, one month artist residency in, in Kyoto, along with my wife who does indigo textiles as well. So. Right, and um, she uses Japanese techniques in her work and Japanese inspired fabrics. Yes, uh, Sashiko mm -hmm. in particular, which is Japanese embroidery. And she uses uh, indigo uh, uh, textiles, Japanese textiles as well. And, uh, and actually traditional, uh, sometimes draws upon traditional um, uh, type of constructs for her bags as well. So we're both deeply influenced by Japan and, and uh, just the aesthetics. Uh, and, um, so th this residency is really part of the continuity of landscape design and what I really was attracted to in landscape design too, because we, 35 years ago, we went there and just looked at Japanese gardens and particularly temple complexes and, and Zen gardens that were in the monastic quarters adjacent to the actual processional spaces that um, were more formalized and more derivative of Chinese influence. Um, anyway, so. Well, that's exciting news. It's so wonderful for both of you. Congratulations. Well, thank you. Yeah, we're looking forward to it. We were going to go in May, but given the circumstances, we had to reschedule to September. Yeah, I hope that one, one day soon we'll get past this period of pandemic that never ends. <laughs> oh, it will pass. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's certainly been an interesting adventure <laughs> that we're all sharing. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm sure that'll be a life-changing experience for both of you. I, I was really fortunate to get to go to um, a small town called Seto near Nagoya for an artist residency. And it it was really life-changing for me. It was wonderful. <laughs> well, this this show that you're you're in, um, it's you and two other painters, Carol Barr and Patty Christie, showing alongside you. And um, we have a woman who does um, soundscapes as well, who's going to be um, leading a a small in-gallery event for us. And you're all approaching scapes in different ways. Um, we're using images of a piece of yours. It's a large wave formation. Um, that would be premonition of a wave. That's it. <laughs> um, we have that on, on the postcard. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so seascapes and landscapes and soundscapes all coming together nicely with the work each of you is going to be sharing in February. Um, we're, we're very excited to share this with the, um, the gallery community and uh, visitors to the island. That would be wonderful having sound as a complement to, to the, the paintings. Um, I oftentimes, I... I, I played music while I paint. And um, actually, I, I very rarely don't paint without having music on. And it, it has a, a critical impact on, 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 on me and energizes me as, as well. The pieces you have in the show, are there any that you'd like to um, speak to specifically? Any, anything that comes to mind that you'd like our audience to know about with specific works? Well, there's a premonition of a, a wave. What I was thinking about um, with that was a Peter Weir film 
call it the wave, which oh, was the last wave with Richard Chamberlain, and it was set in Australia and had to do with the uh, uh, Aboriginal tribe, and they had a dream of a big wave coming to uh, uh, kind of clean, cleanse the world. My all-time favorite movies, actually. I love the Is last. Is that right? One. Yeah. For some reason, I just uh, uh, that was an um, just a tiny little excerpt abstract off of a uh, photograph. Um, and I'm trying to remember the name of the photographer, but she did a whole series on Shakespeare sonnets of reflections off of a mineral bottle, you know, which distorted. And part of this distortion brought up this, this kind of wave-like abstract that was a component of that photograph that for some reason brought up the Peter Weir film. And uh, I thought of being on at the ocean, you know, on the Oregon coast, watching waves break against rocks, mm -hmm. and it just it, all of that kind of, kind of came together. And, and uh, I'm by and large uh, very much a gestural painter, and uh, movement has become more and more important to me as time goes on. Uh, that's one piece that I would draw attention to, and it's on the postcard. So. Other one is Headwaters to the Bay. Um, and that is a more traditional kind of cross section of Daybob Bay. We have a cabin on Daybob Bay and it's a cross section of different environments on Daybob Bay. Um, it's important to me, Headwaters to the Bay kind of reflects my, my uh, environmental conservation background in that I worked mostly what my focus was on was looking at the continuity of kind of riverine systems all the way from headwaters in the mountain uh, through channels, gravity flowing out into bays and estuaries. That painting kind of captures all of those habitats in a concentrated fashion. It's a it's a composite. It came out of my head. I, I didn't draw upon any no drawings, no photographs per se. It's just um, images that are etched in my head that I kind of knit together, and are important to me because I my conservation focus was always holistic in terms of trying to look at that whole system and capture places uh, that I could conserve in the five years that I worked for the uh, land trust uh, in critical places along that continuity, landscape continuity. It's more traditional. It looks a little bit like a woodblock print. What, where is Daybob Bay? Daybob Bay is uh, the north end of uh, Hood Canal. Mm -hmm. It's a, a DNR, it's a natural area conserve that is probably about, oh, I, I don't know, it might be upwards of 4,000 acres now that's been protected. Um, it's a what you call a reference bay, which means that it's an intact bay that has not been um, impacted by development. Hmm. Uh, and it basically, has all the attributes of, uh, of what bays looked like here before uh, development impact. So um, the DNR um, has preserved it as a uh, natural area preserve. And our, our cabin that we have is in the middle of that natural area preserve. So uh, this is, when I go out there, I'm looking at a landscape all the time, you know, and it, it just, it's become so ingrained in me that I can draw upon that visually. Um, and I'm pretty much a visual animal anyway, so. Yeah, thank you for talking to us today and um, sharing more about your life and background and work as an artist and work um, for the environment and how all of that combines in your artistic practice. Um, it's been a pleasure, Scott. Well, thank you. I really appreciate you taking the time to ask me these questions. I don't usually uh, have a 
outlet to to uh, you know uh, share these type of influences with people. So it's great. Yeah. Be sure you don't miss Scapes, our painting show featuring Carol Bearer, Patty Christie, and Scott Pascoe at Bainbridge Arts and Crafts from February 4th through February 15th.